Bless your holy name. Bless your holy name. Bless your holy name. Thank you, Jesus. We honor you. We worship you. Thank you, Lord. Bless your holy name. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Lord. Bless us, Lord. Thank you for everything that you have done this morning, Father. We honor you. We bless you. We praise your holy name. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, you are good and your mercy endures forever. I just bless him for his mercy. His mercy, that stops me from getting what I do deserve. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen, amen. Thank you, promised generation. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen, amen. And this week, for those of you um, in our, in our online um, audience um, who don't know, we've been uh, doing the study by Henry Blackaby entitled Experiencing God. And in the course of last week's study, uh, there was discussion about absolute surrender. Absolute surrender. And so I want to talk this morning in line with that about having the faith for absolute surrender. Having the faith that it takes to be able to surrender absolutely. Amen? Amen. Amen. Uh, let's start with Genesis, the 22nd chapter. You know, one of the things that I have learned over the course of time um, in the body of Christ and one who um, has uh, come up in the things of God over the years is that many times we're told what to do but not how to do it. We're told that we have to be obedient. We're told we have to have faith. We're told that we have to surrender. Um, uh, just two weeks ago, uh, we looked at um, the Shema, which we find in uh, Deuteronomy, the sixth chapter, beginning at the fourth verse. Um, that's, that states, Hear, O Israel, um, the Lord is God. The Lord is our God. Uh, God is one. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy strength. And we have to learn what loving God looks like. And it's critical for us to learn what it looks like because we are to then be a reflection of that love. I shared with those who attended uh, the women's conference with me yesterday at, at Galilee and, and with that uh, group of women, it was a phenomenal conference. The fact that uh, the word name means reputation. And when we name the name of Christ, then we affect God's reputation because people relate his reputation based on what they see in our lives. Amen? So we, we, we need to look at how can I surrender absolutely, completely, and totally? What does that look like? How do I accomplish that? So in Genesis, the 22nd chapter, I, I, I want to look at, at three different individuals that I think gives us uh, a, a, an idea of how to accomplish absolute surrender. 
Genesis 22, beginning at verse 2. I'll, I'll start at verse 1. Sometime later, God tested Abraham's faith. Abraham, God called. Yes, he replied. Here I am. Take your son, your only son, yes, Isaac, whom you love so much, and go to the land of Moriah. Go and sacrifice him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains which I will show you. The next morning, look at this. I'm going to be a minute. You may be seated. Lord, we bless you, we praise you, we give you glory and honor. We thank you, Father, for yet another opportunity to come together in fellowship and love and to sit in your presence. I pray, Lord God, that you would speak to our hearts, that you would send a rhema word, that you would transform our minds and conform our will to yours. In Jesus' name, amen. Look at this now. God says to Abraham, Abraham who waited a hundred years for his son. God promised him at the age of 75 that he who had never had a child would give birth to one who was going to be used to bless all of the other nations. And at a hundred years old, 25 years later, Isaac comes on the scene. And we know that he cherished his son. And God comes to Abraham, who we know to be the father of the faith. He's the father of the Jewish nation. And the Bible says that because he believed God, God accounted it to him for righteousness. And it is because of his faith that we're now able to sit here and, and then to walk in the favor of God. It is Abraham's seed that we are spiritually and all of the blessings and the benefits and the covenant that God made with Abraham for the Jewish nation now applies to us. Because we have been grafted in to the royal family. Amen? Because of our faith. And so here, the father of faith is yet giving us another example of his faith, his absolute surrender. Obedience is an act of faith. That's just the bottom line. If you believe God, then you're going to do what he says. If you have some gaps and some holes in your faith, then you're not going to be able to stand completely when times get hard. Amen? So God says to Abraham, I want you to take that son that you were 100 years old when he was born and offer him as a sacrifice. Offer him as a burnt offering. Now, you have to understand the process of the burnt offering. The burnt offering, uh, everything of the animal was put on the altar after the animal was slaughtered and consumed with fire. Everything except the animal's skin. So God is saying, I want you to butcher your son, I want you to skin your son, and then I want you to burn up his body. And my Bible says, the next morning, wasn't 10 years. He didn't call his prayer partner. He didn't try to get confirmation. He didn't say to the Lord, well, Lord, you know, this is a little deep for me. Uh, I, I need you to send me some signs and wonders. It says the next morning, Abraham got up early. Tell somebody that's faith. That's faith. Tell somebody else that's faith that leads to absolute surrender. That's, that's faith. Now, sometimes, you know, the Lord will speak a small thing to us. And we don't want to act on it because it means giving up something. 
It means sacrificing. It means I can't go my way. I have to submit to another way. I can't have what I want, but I have to share that or give that as God directs me to someone else. Well, Lord, you know, I've been saving up. This is the money for my car. This is the money for my whatever. But God says, I want you to give it to somebody else. Amen? And what do we say? Oh, that ain't the Lord. That, that, that's not God. Or we'll do a piece of what he says. But God says, I want you to give up that which is most precious to you. That which you hold most dear. I think it, it's what, Luke 9, 33, 14, 33. That says that if you're not willing to give up everything, you cannot be my disciple. Um, there, there was, uh, I was reading, and I can't remember who the writer was. Uh, no, no, no. I was, I was, I was looking at a movie, and um, the, uh, the, one of the statements the coach made uh, to, it was a surgeon, made to a, a student surgeon, was, you can accomplish anything if you're willing to give up everything to do it. You can accomplish anything if you're willing to give up everything to do it. Jesus said, you cannot be my disciple if you're not willing to give it up. And that's where our, our point of conflict is. Because I want to be a disciple of Christ. But I want my stuff. That's why he said, if you would try to save your life, you're going to lose it. But if you would lose your life, if you would give up your stuff, if you would be willing to give up everything, then you will save your life. Ask your neighbor, you willing to give it up? Ask the man, tell me everything, everything, everything. You willing to give it up? That you you you're willing to give up your attitude, your mindset, your comfort zone? You willing to give up your stuff? You willing to give up everything that you think belongs to you? Hallelujah. You willing to give it up? You willing to give up what what you think is best for you? You willing to give it up? Are you willing to give up everything? Y'all not talking. Everything, everything, everything. You willing to give it up? We, 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 we don't even have to talk about, let's, let's not even talk about things. Let's talk about our heart. And let's talk about the desires of our heart. Am I willing to give up my vision for my life? Am I willing to give up what I want? You know that thing that you've planted your feet in stubbornly and, and holding ground and saying, this is what is going to be for me. This is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm about. This is what I'm going to have. This is what I want. And this is what I'm going to make happen. I'll do this, but I ain't doing that. Everything. Everything. Now Abraham was a wealthy man. He could have said, well, you know what, Lord? I'm, you understand. You know my heart. You, you, you know what I've been through. So you don't really mean give up my son. What I'm going to do is I'm going to get a thousand of these sheep and these bulls and I'll offer them up to you as a sweet smelling savor. I'll give you this because I don't want it. I'll give up Fred and Elma Fudd because I don't want it. 
Uh, but tall, dark, and handsome ain't going nowhere. I'll give you olive oil, but I'm not going to give you Coca-Cola bottle shape. I'll give you Ishmael. Put Ishmael out, didn't he? And his mama, and his baby mama. But Isaac can't go nowhere, Lord. But Abraham got up early the next morning, saddled his donkey, took two of his servants with him, along with his son Isaac. Chopped wood for a fire, for a burnt offering, and set out for the place that God had told him about. And God didn't tell him where. See, that's where we get lost sometimes because we're waiting for all the details. You know, I, I am just so uh, uh, convinced in my spirit that God is getting ready to open the door of a location for us to go in southern Maryland. And I've noticed, I said, I'm just waiting for him to open the door. I'm not looking for no property. He has let me know when it, the door opens, I can go in it. So I'm waiting for that place that he has told me about that I don't know where I'm going. Abraham, God has said, there's a mountain that I'm going to lead you to. And when you get to that mountain, I want you to sacrifice your only son. Abraham gets up, makes preparation. So you got to learn how to prepare for what God is speaking to your heart. That's how you know that you're walking in faith. If you prepare for what God is saying, you don't see it. That's what faith is. Believing in your heart, which you don't see in, with your eyes. I, 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 don't, I don't see where God is taking me, but I'm already putting things in place so that when the door opens, when the table is set, when the resources come in, whatever the situation is, I'm ready. So I don't know what mountain I'm going to have to sacrifice my son on, but I know I'm going to make a sacrifice because that's what God has said to me. So I'm going to take everything that I need to make the sacrifice. How do you go on a trip to do something and then don't bring what you need to get it done? Look at verse 4. Now this wasn't around the corner. Amen. This wasn't around the corner. It says on the third day of their journey. Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. There was an agreement in his spirit. That this is what God is saying. This is where God wants me to drop anchor. Stay here with the donkey, Abraham told the servants. The boy and I will travel a little further. Now look at his faith. We will worship there and then we will come right back. Now God has said, I want you to sacrifice your son. Abraham says, yes, Lord, if that's what you want, then that's what you are going to get from me. Why? Because nobody's greater than you. Because you're good and your mercy endures forever. See, when we're singing our songs, we have to understand that we're raising a prayer up to the Lord. Amen? We have to understand what we're saying. So, if I say, you know, um, uh, uh, there's nobody greater, then that means that whatever it is that you want from me, Lord, I'm going to give you. Because guess what? I'm not greater than you either. Amen? I'm not great. Why are you all looking at me cross-eyed? You all right? Everybody all right? Do we need to take a potty break? we need a water break? 
Anybody need a fan? We all right? Amen. I'm just trying to get us set free, healed, and delivered. Amen. Praise God. I'm just trying to get us into another place, another dimension, and another level. I'm trying to get us out of the norm and, and, and out of the rituals and the traditions of our past and get us into a spiritual place with God. Get us into a true relationship with God. Amen. I, I'm, you know, faith comes by hearing. So I'm just speaking life into you this morning and trying to shake you loose. And get you into a place where you will truly say, Lord, whatever it takes. I want everything that you have for me. And I want to be all that you need me to be in order for your kingdom to be advanced in the earth. Amen. Amen. So, on the third day, he comes to the mountain. He tells his servants, me and Isaac, we're going to go, we're going to worship, and we'll be right back. I know that God said kill him, but I know that my God is able. I don't know how he's going to work it out. Have you ever been in a place in your life where you did not know how God was going to work it out, but you knew he had to intervene? You knew that God was not going to leave you like you were. That he was not going to leave you in the place that you were. That God had, was going to show up some kind of way. It didn't, the math wasn't working. The money wasn't working. The situation was all jacked up. But you knew, God, you are not going to leave me like this. So we'll be right back. So Abraham placed the wood for the burnt offering on Isaac's shoulders. Now, I, I'm, I'm, I'm coming back to that. While he himself carried the fire and the knife, and as the two of them walked on together, Isaac turned to Abraham and said, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied, we have the fire and the wood, the boy said, but where is the sheep for the burnt offering? And Abraham, who is, has absolutely surrendered to God, says, God will provide a sheep for the burnt offering, my son. Abraham answered, and, and, and they both walked on together. Now, I know that in this passage of scripture, we always look at Abraham. He is the father of the faith. And he, had, he teaches us in every turn of his life what true surrender, absolute surrender is, and what true faith is. But somehow or the other, we tend to dismiss Isaac. Let's take a look at Isaac. Amen? Because Isaac's faith was absolute. Let me tell you why. You know, they paint little pictures of Isaac as this little boy skipping around behind his daddy. And his daddy says, come on, we're going to go and we're going to worship. And we're gonna. But you have to understand that in order for a full fire to be able to consume an animal, it has to burn for a long period of time. And it requires an amount of wood that is heavy, so heavy that only an adult male can carry it. The Bible says that Abraham, who is now probably 120 years old, if not more, puts the wood for the sacrifice on Isaac's shoulders. He was not a child. He was not a teenager. He was a young man. A young man that Abraham, no doubt, had been teaching about his God. And as they go and they arrive at the mountaintop, Abraham ties him down on the altar and raises the knife to kill his son. And in none of the transcripts do I see where Isaac 
has an issue with what his daddy's doing. We're talking about absolute surrender. Abraham, I believe, said, look, God has given you to me and God is requiring your life. God wants you as a sacrifice. And so I believe and I trust God. He is the only God. And I'm willing to give him what he wants. And Isaac probably said, Dad, if God says he wants me, have at it. If it's going to cost me, isn't that the definition of love? I want the best for you even if it costs me. If God is pushing you into a place, I, I know you all did a, uh, uh, a uh, role play on Thursday about the husband and the wife where the husband had the vision and the wife didn't see it right away. But eventually the wife says, if that's what God wants for us, then I'll sacrifice with you in order that the will of God would be performed in your life. So that means that I'm going to have to step back sometimes. That I'm going to have to give more than maybe I had planned to give. That I'm going to have to go above and beyond. I'm going to have to do without sometimes. I'm going to have to make the sacrifices in order for God to have his way in you. It's not always about us and how holy and gifted and anointed we are. But God wants us to use our faith to push somebody else into their purpose. To get somebody else where they belong. We're very selfish as Westerners when it comes to the kingdom and the things of God. It's bless me, anoint me, prosper me, show yourself in me. We have to develop a big picture mentality. God told Abraham, I'm going to bless you, yes. But I'm also going to make you a blessing. How can we be a blessing if we're not willing to absolutely surrender? Verse 9, when they arrived at the place where God had told him to go, Abraham built an altar and arranged the wood on it. Then he tied his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And Abraham picked up the knife to kill his son as a sacrifice. What does that word shema, hear mean? It means to hear and take action. Abraham heard the voice of God and he took action. God said, sacrifice your son. Abraham said, I will do that. And he was about to get into it when God said, okay. It's all right. I've provided a lamb for the sacrifice and caught in the thickets was that which God provided so that Isaac did not have to be sacrificed. Absolute surrender. Absolute surrender. That's what it takes to walk with God. Jesus says you've got to be willing to give up uh, everything. Look at Second Timothy chapter four. Look at this theme of sacrifice in relationship to faith. Because of Abraham and Isaac's faith. See, 
Abraham believed God for resurrection. He believed him for resurrection. Okay, I'll kill my son, but you made me some promises. We have to understand walking in faith regarding purpose. Abraham knew God had made some promises. Here, Isaac is a young man, but he hasn't gotten married. He hasn't had children. God has said it's through your seed that all of the other nations of the world are going to be blessed. So Abraham had to be thinking, well, if God said he was going to bless the world through my seed, and this is my seed, and my seed has not given seed, then God's got to work this thing out. And see, when you know that you're walking in purpose, when you know that God has predestined you, that there is something that he has called you to do, you don't get upset when the enemy tries to threaten you. When the enemy tries to make you think that this thing is not going to happen because you have absolutely surrendered to this thing. You're able to continue through the storm, through the rain, through the fire, through the flood. Regardless of, of, of what um, happens in your life. Uh, one of the things I like that Pastor Lisa Hall, uh, Weathers Hall said yesterday was, God wants to get us to a place where our faith is independent of our circumstances. Where when, when, what's going on in your life does not shake you. It doesn't change what you know about God. Just because there's a hurricane going on outside of your door, it doesn't stop you from planning to go to work next week. But a lot of times, when we see the hurricane, we just give up. Oh, this is it. This is it. All is lost. All is gone. I'm at the end of it. No need in moving forward. Let's just scrap this. Too many problems. But we learned a couple of, a few weeks ago that just because God tells you to move forward doesn't mean you're not going through the storm. That should be something that's already worked into your plan A. It's storm. As the people of God, we see the word of God telling us that those that will live godly shall suffer persecution. The psalmist said, this poor man cried and God heard me and delivered me out of all of my trouble. Trouble is a kingdom reality. So because I'm a Christian, I factor in the component of trouble. Because I'm on a mission for God, I know that the enemy's not going to like it. And he's going to show up somewhere. You anticipate that. When, when you have your family over for Christmas, don't you have a couple of miscellaneous gifts laying around? Because somebody's going to bring an extra somebody. And you don't want everybody in there unwrapping packages. And the extra somebody doesn't have anything. So you've got some generic gifts. Amen. You anticipate that thing. You know the enemy's going to show up. If he came on the scene with Jesus and tried to derail his purpose and his destiny, why would he not pop up in your life and pop up in the place that is most important to you? He's going to touch that which you treasure the most. That's why Jesus said, don't lay your treasures up in, in the earth where the thief can come in or it can rot, the moths can rot it. But let your treasures be in the kingdom, in heaven. Stop holding dear those things that are going to pass away. Heaven and earth is going to pass away. My word is going to stand. 
And so the enemy's going to touch that which is most valuable to you. Because he knows you'll drop everything and be focused on, oh, oh, my child. Oh, my child, baby. I can't do nothing because my child messed up. Oh, I can't do nothing because... Oh, I've got, oh, my husband, oh, my, my lover, oh, oh, oh. He's going to touch that which is most valuable to you. If things is your thing, then he's going to touch your things. He's going to mess with your house. He's going to mess with your car. He's going to mess with your job. He's going to mess with anything that you build yourself up in. And here, God has your purpose and a plan for you, but you can't get there because you're not absolutely surrendered. You know, in those spy movies, the spies have this thing where you don't get attached to anything you can't walk away from in 10 minutes. When uh, the family home caught on fire while the children were sleeping, I realized at that moment there was nothing in that house that was important to me but my children. You've got to be able to walk away and let it go. You've got folks in unhealthy, ungodly relationships because they don't want to give up stuff. This mine, this, 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 you, this, you know, I don't want to give this up, so I'm going to sit here and let them beat my head. Relationships, they don't want you and don't want anybody else to have you. Stuck there, this mine, I'm not giving it up. Amen, tight is good. <laughs> Second Timothy 4, you all there? Verse 6, for I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous God, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all of them also that love his appearing. Here Abraham, he trusted, he had, was totally surrendered to, to God, and he was believing God for resurrection. He was, his faith told him that I've got purpose and I've got a promise from God, and I am going to obey God because I know that he's faithful to his word. Now you've got Paul who is believing God for reward. And is believing God, his faith is, is, is absolute, is, 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 has led him to a place of absolute surrender. And he says in Philippians 3 and 10, I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death, so that one way or another, I will experience the resurrection from the dead. Here he's trusting in God's power. Abraham was trusting in God's promise. Here Paul is trusting in God's power, looking to God for a reward. And now, let's go to Hebrews, the 12th chapter.
we still see the sacrifice that comes with absolute surrender. Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 12, you there? Verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. Now, the, that therefore is taking us back to the 11th chapter where uh, Paul, uh, well, the writer of the Hebrews is believed to be Paul, but not confirmed. But the writer of the Hebrews is, is, is giving the talk about how faithful God's people were. Let's, let's go back to the 11th chapter. Hebrews 11.33, by faith, these people overthrew kingdoms, ruled what, well, uh, 32, 11.32. Eh, it's so good. Well, the whole chapter talks about the faith of God's people. 11.32, how much more do I need to say? It would take too long to recount the stories of the faith of Gideon, Barak, uh, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and all the prophets. By faith, these people overthrew kingdoms, ruled with justice, and received what God had promised them. They shut the mouths of lions, quenched the flames of fire, and escaped death by the edge of the sword. We're talking about absolute surrender now. Their weakness was turned to strength. They became strong in battle and put whole armies to flight. Women received their loved ones back again from death, but others were tortured, refusing to turn from God in order to be set free. They placed their hope in a better life after the resurrection. Some were jeered at and their backs were cut open with whips. Others were chained in prisons. Some died by stoning. Some were sawed in half. And others were killed with the sword. Some went about wearing skins of sheep and goats, destitute and oppressed and mistreated. They were too good for this world, wandering over deserts and mountains, hiding in caves and holes in the ground. And people tell us, if, if you love the Lord, you ought to be driving a Mercedes. If you ought to be wearing a mink coat. You ought to have diamonds. All these people earned a good reputation because of their what? Yet none of them received all that God had promised. For God had something better in mind for us so that we would not reap. They they would not reach perfection without us. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down. We need to take an evaluation of our lives. And we know what it is that's messing us up, tripping us up, slowing us down, delaying us in the purpose of God. Especially the sin, somebody say sin, sin. that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes where? On Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because the joy awaiting him, because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross. Absolute surrender. 
disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. See, the pictures uh, um, uh, that depict the crucifixion shows those who were uh, crucified on the cross. Some of them, their hands are tied, you know, and they're just hanging there, and they've got this cute little lawn cloth. But you have to understand that when they were crucified, when it says despising the shame, they were crucified naked. We say butt naked. And they were on that cross, day in and day out, some of them. So what is happening? People are watching them urinate and defecate on themselves. Right there. Shame. Jesus went through all of that. Humiliation, agony. The term excruciation, excruciating comes from crucifixion. He went through all of that for us. And we don't want to give up a cupcake. We don't want to give up a bag of chips. We don't want to give up a no good somebody. We don't want to give up nonsense and junk and mess. But Jesus had his confidence and his trust in the love of the Father. Jesus hung on that cross, absolutely surrendered. The Bible says he learned obedience by the things that he suffered. That he did it joyfully, disregarding the shame. Why? Because he trusted that God the Father was going to save us. He knew. See, if Jesus didn't know, if he wasn't sure that the Father was going to save us, he wouldn't have died on that cross. When you know somebody's shaky, do you invest in them? You may want to. But you know they're not going to come through. Would you give up your life for somebody who makes you a promise? Not knowing if they're going to fulfill it? That's what happens when we disobey God. We're saying to God, I don't trust you. You a liar. I know you said if I would give you 10% of whatever I have, whether it's a dime or whether it's $100 million, that you would see that I lack nothing, but I don't trust you. So I'm going to take my dime out of this dollar and add it to my 90 cents, and I'm going to spend the whole dollar because I, I'm not quite sure. I'm going to stay in this ungodly, unholy relationship, this unsanctified relationship, because, you know, I'm not sure, God, that you've got something better for me. I'm going to continue to act like a clown, fight my own battles, and act like a barbarian. I'm going to continue to talk with this unsanctified mouth. Because I really don't trust you to fight my battles. I hear you, Lord, but I don't believe you. I heard what you said, but I'm not really feeling you. Because there's nobody greater than me. Your faith is only as good as what you put it in. And if your faith is not in God, if you're not believing God, if you're not trusting God, who are you trusting? You're trusting you. I 
I don't believe you to be able to keep me, Lord. If, if I say that I'm coming out of, of, of this ungodly habit and addiction, I'm going to put down these things that are destroying my body, which is your temple. I'm not going to do it, Lord. You know why? Because I don't believe that you really exist. I'm in the prime of my life, Lord. I, I'm, I'm trying to get, 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 get what I want. And if I do it your way, it's not going to happen because that's not the way the world operates. So I'm going to do it my way. And after I get it my way, then I'll surrender to you. When we don't surrender to God, it's because we really don't believe him. We trust in man more than we do God. You know, I, I, I share with you all all of the time. When we were growing up, you didn't have the craziness with children because we believed when they, our parents told us, I will kill you. Do I have amen back there, Robert? That was a familiar passage of scripture. <laughs> I will kill you. You either do what I say or you die. And as 50 and 60 year olds, we still don't mess with Big Mama. Because she will stand on a chair and beat you in the head. Our parents didn't run back and forth to the school. We didn't bring notes home. We, bringing a note home from your teacher, what happened, Nancy? A note, and it didn't have A's written on it, saying come to the assembly for the award. My mother used to say to us, I don't care about the low grades. I can deal with that. I mean, she did care. She worked hard with us. She said, but the grade I'm concerned with is citizenship. If you don't bring an A in citizenship, you can behave if you as dumb as a doorknob. I don't even think they got citizenship on the report cards anymore. Depending on what school they're at, right? And we believe that. We believe that if, if, if we messed up at church and all you got was a look, there was two looks. That was, there was the, I know that's not you. That was the, and you straighten up. I'm sorry, I apologize. I lost my mind for a minute. And you kind of move down from the folks who's acting simple on that row. Ain't me, ain't me, it's not me, it's them. And then there was that, you're going to get it tonight, look. I had to look over, I'm on this choir right here, but I, I had to look at you twice. That was the you going to die tonight look. And everything was wonderful, and we, we had fried chicken or pork shoulder and potato salad and collard greens and a sweet potato pie and some homemade fresh squeezed lemonade with lots of good sugar in it. Washed up the dishes. Look at Ed Sullivan. And somewhere between Ed Sullivan, your bath, and the bed. Yeah, yeah. 
somebody came creeping through the dark. See, that's the real horror movie. Forget <laughs> Chucky. <laughs> Chucky ain't have nothing on a mad baby Steve McAllister. And, and, and my point is that there were a lot of things I know in my life that didn't go down because I didn't want to have to deal with Steve and Edna. Amen. I didn't want to have to deal with it. So, so I gave consideration and made some decisions that I didn't want to make but I didn't want to deal with the consequences. And that should be how we govern our lives in Christ according to God's word. If God says you can't have it, you can't have it. Get over it. He's not taking everything from you. He's only taking that which is not good. God knows he looks good and smells good and talks smooth and makes the hair stand up on the back of your neck and all. I ain't just talking to the youngins. But God knows that be a life with him would be hell. You can't get away from Elma Fudd, I'm going to tell you. But I'm going to tell you, Elma Fudd will play you too, so you get, you know, got to be careful. And when you get played by Elma Fudd, that's just wrong. <laughs> that's just wrong. So we're not giving them too much credit. We're just saying give them a look. Do you know that the cross that the cross that Jesus carried on his shoulders for us remember Isaac carried wood that was so heavy only a grown man could carry Jesus cross was over 300 pounds Jesus cross was over 300 pounds So that's carrying me and Janice on your back at the same time. Anybody, any other guys want to try that? Did I, did I just hear somebody's back crack <laughs> at the thought? <laughs> he said, you take a ride. <laughs> yes but his absolute surrender is what made it happen for us. Your surrender is going to make it happen for somebody else, if no more than your children. You don't have to be the worldwide evangelist. Just get your children in. It's a process, yes. Get your mama in. Get your husband in. Get your wife in. Carry that cross. Jesus said, if any man come after me, he's got to do what? Deny himself. You've got to have absolute surrender. Take up your cross daily. Not just on Sunday. I'm taking up my cross. I'm going to church and sitting here for two hours, two whole hours. We've been in services where they praise God for two hours. <laughs> That's another story. We'll tell you that when we're not on the air. <laughs> Pick up your cross daily. And follow me. 
absolute surrender. Let's stand.